Wednesday morning, Birds fans. Appreciate you streaming in here on Birds 365. You got Mac and Mac. That would be John McMullen and Jody McDonald. Good to see we've got the uh, comments back on our uh, StreamYard feed today. Uh, looking forward to hearing from some of you diehard Birds fans, some of you knuckleheads who check in too and uh, are a little off the wall. Uh, I, I at least like to see where you're going to go on a day in, day out basis. We had StreamYard issues. Off the wall. Yeah. A couple, couple guys sometimes. are a little off the wall, but I yeah, like that. I appreciate their offbeat. Outlook. As long as they like it, like the show. I don't care. Right. Yeah, you can write whatever the hell you want and take yeah. pot shots at me or John or anybody else or any of the Eagles or coaches or players or whatever else. But make sure you like the show. That's that's a key. You, you got to at least give us our props, even if you vehemently disagree with something we say. And we'll do it again for the next three hours here on uh, Birds 365. All right, Johnny Mac. Coordinator talk is the main topic around the Eagles these days, understandably so, because they got two major vacancies to fill with uh, Jonathan Gannon and Shane Steichen both going out the door. And we found out yesterday they had already interviewed a couple more candidates, uh, Chris Shula from the Rams and uh, Jesse Minter from the University of Michigan, their defensive coordinator. So they've uh, interviewed three. They've got two more at a minimum that are coming in from the outside to interview, including Vance uh, Joseph today being virtually interviewed. And we talked about that play yesterday. By the way, that already started. That started yesterday. So they were a day behind. So uh, evidently Vance met with Nick Sirianni yesterday. Today is going to be Jeffrey Lurie, Howie Roseman. So the original report was uh, Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. So now it's Tuesday, Wednesday. So okay. We'll so they're in, in that process already, <laughs> and they haven't met as far as the reports go. You tell me different again. If I got wrong, Deshaun Desai, um, someone they want to interview and want to talk with. Uh, don't know if they've accomplished that just yet. Here's my first question of the day for you, John. Um, when both Sirianni and, and Gannon uh, walked out the door to become head coaches, uh, two immediate guys from the staff rose up the charts to become the top internal candidate, um, one on offense, one on defense. They've already talked to at least four guys on the defensive side, probably a fifth. Who knows? Even more. You don't know when you know they would like to get a hire done before the combine, which is the end of next week. So there's there's a quasi timetable on it. And as far as you've reported or any of your other good ego beat guys, they've interviewed exactly zero external candidates for the offensive coordinator position. If you're Denard Wilson, are you like get up in the morning and shrug and go what the hell did i do wrong why, why did i have to bring in all these guys for a uh, defensive coordinator position when they're just kind of twiddling their thumbs on the offensive side getting ready to hand the job to somebody on the staff yeah. what's denard wilson saying to himself these days probably same thing you're saying probably you know aware that he's not sort of as locked in as uh, uh, Brian Johnson is, as the offensive on the offensive side. I mean, there's not many other ways he can take it. Um, I know a lot, you know, you know, the immediate, and, and as I said, I, I don't necessarily disagree with it is the interpretation that, you know, not being sure on the internal candidate, which would in this case be Denard Wilson, you know, they'll tell you, you got to take advantage of the situation to pick people's brains. And, you know, it's a rare opportunity to hear about uh, schematic theories and all that. Well, you know, why aren't you doing that for the offense? Exactly. And, and maybe you can, they you are. can't tell that line of thinking yeah. if you're only doing it on one of the two sides of the ball when you have openings on both sides. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're asking, and, it, and all this is is opinion and speculation, obviously, because as I mentioned earlier in the week, this is sort of the last bastion, the unknown sort of mm -hmm. in the NFL world. And you don't know how guys are thinking really. Um, and in this case, it's Jeffrey and Howie and Nick. Um, it, it's pretty clear. And the first indication was they were willing to pay Jonathan Gannon you know, head coaching money to come back. Uh, that 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 tells me more than anything else that they were not sure 
of Denard Wilson or anybody else, whether it was Nick Rollis and Nick is gone now, uh, they weren't they weren't as concrete with those guys as as you know Brian Johnson or even Kevin Petulo on the offensive side. That's what it tells me. Um, and and more than the interviews that 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 because remember that's coming off the Super Bowl where everybody's jumping off buildings and setting their hair on fire and that's the worst defensive coordinator in the history of the world and blah 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 and Jeffrey Lurie says hey I'll pay you to stay um, essentially as much as the Cardinals I think that tells you all you need to know to be honest I I know where you go with that and. Pardon me if I'm the glass half empty guy again. If you're Shane Steichen, how do you feel? The, both are up for uh, coaching positions, head coaching positions elsewhere, interview for the uh, spot. Again, uh, Steichen ahead of the curve because he interviewed for the first time prior to the Super Bowl even being played. Got and waited until after the Super Bowl for his first and I guess winning interview with the Cardinals because he got the gig shortly thereafter. Does Shane Sykin say to himself, wait a minute, why didn't you offer to pay me head coach money to stick around and stay as the offensive coordinator? You went to pretty good lengths to at least try and keep John. It was like, wave to me as I go out the door. Shane, good job. See you later. Good well, luck, bud. No. Glad we're I not paying from, you. I think from Shane's perspective, you know, he's got bigger issues to worry about, number one. But number two, offensive versus defensive coach. The head coach is an offensive guy. So, I mean, it's his offense. It's his scheme. It's, you know, Shane Steichen's doing what, what, what Nick wants. And as much as Nick gets involved and he gets involved more than most coaches in, you know, the defensive side, the, he'll, he'll admit that's not his expertise. That was Jonathan Gannon's beat them. That's how it works. I mean, when Doug was here, Jim Swartz, Hey, check in every once in a while and do what you need to do on the defensive side. So when you have an offensive co head coach, the other side's more important and vice versa. If you had a defensive head coach, the offensive guy would be more important. That's sort of, that's sort of baked into the, the whole thing. So, you know, the Eagles have proven, you know, they, Jeffrey Jordan, the Jeffrey Lurie era, his first hire was a defensive guy. But ever since then, he's he's kind of readjusted himself and realigned himself and realized, you know, the best way to win the modern NFL. And he's not wrong. You, you got to worry about the offense first and foremost. And I said back in the day, I say it all the time, back in the day, good defense could be good offense. Now it's the exact opposite. Good offense can, good offense beats good defense. We saw it in the Super Bowl, um, and I don't. To be honest, I don't think the fan base is caught up to that mentality. But whether it's Kansas City giving up, you know, forty points, or or the Eagles getting smoked in the second half, you know, San Francisco getting smoked here. Good offense beats good defense now. So yeah, I, I agree with Jeff Lurie's mentality and. When you have an offensive setup as a head coach, the defensive coordinator is more important. Understood, because you're right. Sirianni is uh, the guy who, even if he's not calling plays, it's his offense. Uh, the one thing you said, and and we've had a couple other guys say, I think on the show, at least one. Um, I, I, I think I'm on an island by myself on this one. I actually think that Shane Steichen's in a better position than Jonathan Gannon. I, I think the Colts right now where they fit NFL I think they're in a better position and I know the Colts are going to be going with a rookie quarterback and the Cardinals are going with an established quarterback but an established quarterback who's going to start the year hurt and is already making top flight money whereas you're going to be if you're Shane Steichen you're going to be able to step into the same exact position you are here in uh Philadelphia a young quarterback on a rookie deal now, we got no idea if either uh, Young or Stroud are going to be the level of Jalen Hurts, but I I think I'd prefer to, to take my shot with that, roll my dice with that, than with Kyler already getting paid, usually gets hurt, is hurt, and he's a little bit of a flake. Kyler Murray mm -hmm. running my team. Plus, I think the Colts have some better defensive players already in place. So I actually think that Steichen's in a better spot than Gannon is right now. 
Yeah, I mean, you can make the argument, it, it, especially if you get the quarterback right, but we got to know if you get the quarterback right. If you get the right quarterback, you're you're 100% right. But even even then, and I look at Trevor Lawrence, there's that, you know, already I'm 10 minutes in the show. I got two, two gym sports references, startup costs. Like, you're not getting a better prospect than Trevor Lawrence, and you still have startup costs with Trevor. Now, he's I think he's headed in, in, in a great direction. Uh, took a big step forward. But even last year as a playoff team, you know, he struggled at times. All young quarterbacks struggle at times. Uh, so you have those stored up startup costs. How quickly, you know, that's the amazing thing about Jalen Hurts. <laughs> Forget about first round versus second round. Um, you know, even his first year as a starter, which he was pretty good. I mean, Pro Bowl alternate, certainly not terrible. I know a lot of people criticized him, but it was pretty solid. Um, his first year as a starter, and then he took the big leap. Um, a lot of that has to do with the offensive line, the skill position, all that kind of stuff, the coaching, Jalen's work ethic. Point is, man, and and from both their situations, look, you got wacky owners. I mean, that doesn't help. Right. Go oh, from I, Jeffrey I, Lord I don't to, think either one of them are in good yeah. spot as far as ownership yeah. goes, but yeah. I don't know what I I would rate one wackier than the other. Yeah, exactly. So they're they're you know from that standpoint, they're not going to get as much help as they got here as coordinators. Um, yeah, a lot of things come into it, but I, I understand what you're saying in the quarterback. If if you get the quarterback right, and if he starts playing well on his rookie deal, you have that little window. But as you mentioned, and you were right yesterday on the show, Patrick Mahomes, you know, Tom Matthew Stafford, Tom Brady, make a lot of money, make a lot of money, make a lot of money. It's it, as as much as it hurts to think about it in this time of the year when the Eagles are going to sign Jalen Hurts to an extension, whatever it is, and you're going to go. There's going to be a bunch of hand wringing, and I don't know why because it's not anybody's. It's not my money. It's not your money. It's not the fans' money. Let Jeffrey worry about that. He's going to pay him. It's better to have the established guy than the cross your fingers guy. And I think that's what Jonathan Gannon said. Basically, you know, he loves Philadelphia. His wife's from Philadelphia. For those who don't know, she's a Temple gal. All all that kind of stuff one of the reasons he came here in the first place um even though we got all the criticism um she loved it here she wanted to be here um and that's always a big thing i think people don't put real life circumstances into these things and especially in such a nomadic profession uh but so his wife is very happy being here um all things being equal you know if he had Fifth pick in the draft versus whatever was in the app, fourth, whatever it fourth, is, yeah. fourth or fifth, fourth versus an established quarterback. Maybe he thinks about it more. I don't know. Maybe he says, you know what? I'll I'll stay here, and get paid like a head coach, because I don't have a quarterback. I I I always prefer certainty rather than uncertainty. And you can say what you want about Kyler Murray. You're ignoring his first three seasons if you just focus on last season because he was pretty stinking good. Now, I'm concerned like everybody else when you got to put in clauses to his contract about studying and all that kind of stuff. But the skill set, it's pretty good. And yeah, I would say pretty good. Not not top level, and he's already being paid top level. And that is one of the unfortunate realities of the NFL. You're right about – I don't care about Bidwell's money or Ursay's money or Jeff Flory's money. That's their money. It's not my money, so I can get past that really quickly. But it's a cap world in which you live. You do have to be able to pay a quarterback and then field a very good team at all your other positions. He goes, lucky to have a good guy who does a great job with the cap like Howie Roseman. Uh, grand, brand new general manager out there in uh, uh, Arizona, who we have no idea how good he will be at balancing a cap. Um, so that is uh, to be determined. Um, I made the point yesterday about the last three Super Bowl winners being quote unquote veteran quarterbacks making top of the money. More so to uh, argue against those who say the trend in the NFL will be take your quarterback, keep him five years, and then churn. 
Turn it over. Get your next rookie quarterback. Don't even bother. Not realistic. Talking. I say that. I think about it, Jody. It's not realistic, though. It is. It's not realistic because even if you hit once, you're not going to hit it again and again and again and again. We see. I, I mean, we see the development of quarterbacks, and I call it the college mentality: just reload, and you're you're able to build up around them better. You are able to build up around them better. But if the quarterback can't play, the quarterback can't play. I mean, and and the thing, oh. To use Jalen Hurts as an example, we're going to trap the next Jalen Hurts. Well, good luck with that. You know, good luck with that. Uh, and you, you see the quarterback strapped it in front of him. You see all the quarterbacks, you know, part of it is organization again. Part of it is coaching. Part of it is own, his own work ethic and all that kind of stuff. You can't duplicate that. You can't replicate that. And that's why you're going to pay him $48, $50 million average annual value. Can't exactly. do it. Uh, you can you can have it in theory, in philosophy, it's a potential way to go that makes sense. But then you actually have to pick the guys that have to become as good a player as the one you're letting walk out the door. Good luck. That that doesn't happen. Off uh, maybe once every blue moon in the NFL, it isn't going to be just standard operating procedure. So that, that's why I made that point yesterday about the veteran guys. All right, one quick note before we get Mike Gill up. Our buddy from down the shore, 97.3, uh, the Sports Bash ESPN Radio, is going to jump in with us. Uh, right here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel yesterday, there was another hat thrown into the ring for Eagles defensive coordinator. Our very own Seth Joyner said, if chosen, I will serve. Ready to become the defensive coordinator of the Philadelphia Eagles. He said it on the National Football Show with Dan Cilio. You don't think there's any chance of that happening, do you, Johnny Mac? Uh, no, I don't. And I love Seth and I'm on with Seth all the time on the post game show, the pregame show. Um, yeah, no, I mean, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to, it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, Seth has been out of the game a long time. He hasn't gotten into the coaching ranks. It's sort of like Mike Schmidt in baseball back in the day where he wanted to become the Phillies manager. And I've talked about it and, with Josh McCown. And I do think there's sort of a closed mindedness to, you know, when Josh was in the mix to be uh, Houston's head coach, everyone would say, he's got no experience. He's got no experience. I'm like, well, except the 20 years he played and every offensive scheme under the sun. And everybody talks about how smart he is. And now after that, he's finally gone into coaching um, and and it'll probably be a head coach in a couple of years because he's finally stuck his, uh, toe in the pool um, and now people can't throw that at sort of ownership that don't show the courage of their own convictions but you know Seth's been out of it a long time and he hasn't gotten into it and no they're not going to consider something like that and the second thing I love Seth but it's a different game it's a different game and he said on the show and I saw the clip it's not as different as people think it is. It's really different, actually. It's different to the point that I don't like it. Seth and I are on the same page. I don't like it, to be honest. But it's the reality, and it's not changing because of the safety rules, uh, the the offense they want to, to amplify. They make things easier. It is a completely, completely, completely different game. I can't say that enough from when Seth played. And if you're going to show up and, you know, do Jim Johnson things, well, you, A, you're going to be in trouble. B, from a standpoint of you're going to get a lot of flags, <laughs> number one. And, you know, even from the way the game has evolved, from a schematic standpoint, you're going to be in a lot of trouble when you're facing certain quarterbacks who know how to handle the blitz, so. And shoot, I brought up Seth names before before Birds three sixty five ever started the last however many years on WIP, wondering if Seth had any interest in becoming a coach. Uh, your Mike Schmidt reference, I think, is on point. It, the The coordinator position is a pretty big job. Shoot, the Eagles just offered Jonathan Gannon head coaching money to stick around and be their defensive coordinator. Uh, so that's something you, you don't and, just step and, in and, and tone take. Uh, tone. Uh, chimed in and said he, he he would come in as the linebackers coach to make it more realistic. Um, you know, uh, he could probably teach people how to play linebacker. Uh, 
you know, in, in that more, uh, because that's about technique and fundamentals and, um, you know, but, it, you know, he, I think he's been out of it too long for anyone to say, uh, we're going to make him a position coach. Uh, but that's it. And, and, Here's- and he, and the other part is Jody, you know, and God bless Seth because, you know, he does a great job on, on all the platforms, you know, he's too vocal about it. You know, they don't want, they don't want that. They don't want those waves. Agreed. And the, the other thing, and I, I'm not talk, just talking about the Eagles here. I'm talking about the NFL. This is a very broad brush stroke statement. So uh, if you got to hit me up, Oh, not there. Yeah, but not here. Not, I, I'm not saying every situation, every single team, just in general, the linebacker is almost becoming a, an extinct animal. In yeah, the National Football that League. hurts too. Certainly the way Seth played it, it's not played like that in the NFL anymore. It's just not. And not just not here in Philadelphia, not across the National Football League. And I know Nick Rallis just got the uh, defense coordinator position in Arizona. So Jonathan Gannon at least appreciates the personality I don't know that the linebacker coach is a stepping stone position to become a defensive corner because linebackers are becoming damn well extinct around the yeah. national. Yeah, I think league. you know if Seth walked into the locker room tomorrow and saw Nickobe Dean, I'd go. I think he'd say, "You're a linebacker because uh, yeah. you're not a big guy." Uh, it's a, it's a completely completely different game. He's John McBone. I'm Jody McDonald. We are Mac and Mac here on Birds Three Sixty Five. Plenty of bird conversation. You're coming away. We need a third voice. We've got a good one at that to join us. Our pal Mike Gill from down the shore on 97.3 ESPN. The Sports Bash jumping in as usual Wednesday spot here with us on.